Movie audiences have always been thrilled by the apparent danger of a spectacular high fall. But falling effects have come a long way since Alfred Hitchcock sent a saboteur off the Statue of Liberty. Today's sophisticated moviegoers demand that filmmakers aspire to greater and greater heights. In the Hudsucker Proxy, the character played by Tim Robbins free falls 45 stories to the street below. And filmmakers Joel and Ethan Cohen want the audience to see the expression on the actor's face on the way down. Coming up, we'll learn how the special effects wizards combine a miniature Manhattan with a plummeting Tim Robbins to create this hair-raising illusion. And we'll see how an actual free fall staged for the action thriller Time Cop results in one of the film's most shocking moments, next on Movie Magic. The movie is The Hudsucker Proxy, a stylized comic fairy tale created by the writing, producing, and directing duo of Joel and Ethan Cohen. The Cohen brothers have honed their unique visual style in such films as Raising Arizona and Barton Fink. Now with Hudsucker and a cast that boasts Paul Newman, Charles Durning, and Tim Robbins. The Coens are determined to light up the silver screen with such innovative moving images as exploding hula hoops. And two particularly challenging falling sequences that begin and end the film. Charles Durning and then Tim Robbins must plummet down the side of a 45-story skyscraper. Complicating Robin's fall is the fact that just before he hits the ground, the law of gravity is suspended and he comes to a screeching halt. To achieve this gravity-defying illusion, the Coens turn to mechanical effects wizard Peter Chesney. Peter and his company, Image Engineering, created inventive physical effects for Disney's Honey, I Shrunk the Kids and Honey, I Blew Up the Kid. The Hudsucker falling sequence will demand extensive research and development and a healthy dose of ingenuity. When designing special effects for film, I play in theoretical physics and then translate that into a practical reality. What I like is the gathering up the whole idea and trying to find the right solution that gives the most to the camera. Peter will work closely with visual effects supervisor Michael McAllister whose credits include E.T. and Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. The Coen brothers had a, a very specific vision of these falling sequences, and it involved uh, a much longer period of time to reach the ground than in real life. And also the idea of seeing that it was actually Tim Robbins falling and not some stuntman was crucial to the sequence. The Coens described their vision of the sequence to the effects team. They wanted to look as if Tim Robbins stepped out of an airplane and into a skydiving freefall. That's easy. Yeah. To study the physical characteristics of a freefall, Peter watches videotapes of skydivers. His goal is to design mechanical devices that will simulate the same freefall characteristics. Usually, the first step in the design process is to understand the visual that's really wanted by the director. I scan in the storyboards frequently and then I go through a geometric study of what's going on from the perspective of the camera. From the storyboards and computer studies, Peter ascertains that Tim Robbins' fall will require two major elements. A fairly simple flying harness for the end of the sequence and a more complex elevator rig for the beginning. You've needed a free fall, a live actor starting from a close-up then the complexity comes in is that he's also rotating backwards and so he's going to be stopping on his back. With filming to take place on a soundstage only 40 feet tall, 
Peter has very limited space in which to accomplish the illusion of a long freefall. To maximize the length of the fall, he decides to build a camera platform above the rafters of the stage, where it will look straight down at the actor as he drops away. Peter determines that the elevator's two aluminum support beams will need to be placed 20 feet apart to keep them out of camera range. He then constructs a cross beam that moves up and down the aluminum beams on rubber wheels. Robbins will wear a body harness that attaches to the cross beam. After designing the elevator rig, Peter and Mike turn their attention to the complex harness that must safely support Tim Robbins. It's important where there is some sort of performance factor that the actor is comfortable. To accomplish this, Peter and his staff start by making a full body mold of Robbins so they can fit the harness to an exact replica of the actor's body. Then they begin to construct the harness itself. Rigging seamstress Jennifer McManus forms a backplate made of polyform, a medical splinting plastic. Next, a mountaineering style harness of nylon webbing and leather is sewn to the polyform shell. There's our Velcro. <laughs> Peter uses Velcro so Robbins can get in and out of the harness with relative ease. He conducts a series of stress tests to determine how much weight the Velcro will sustain before it fails. You hear it snap crackling and popping, so that means it's content with this weight and we can add more weight, which we're going to do now. To ensure that the actor remains secured in the harness, Peter designs the Velcro closure to hold at least 1,000 pounds, more than five times the actor's weight. Safety is also Peter's main concern when he designs the metal plate that attaches Robbins to the elevator rig. This is how he gets attached to the entire rig. So then we're giving him his rotation point. This is the main connection, all this stuff is really beefy because it's got to be safe. This gives you the, the rock laterally that's going to happen as well as give them a little bit of a float. The elevator rig is designed so that Robbins will come to a smooth stop at the end of his 35-foot fall. Peter employs three different braking systems. For the primary system, Peter uses nearly two miles of strong, flexible bungee cord attached to mountaineering rope. Peter's first set of backup brakes are cords attached to heavy nautical chains, which act as counterweights to stop the rig. Finally, in the unlikely event that the other two systems both fail, Peter installs hydraulic shock absorbers to serve as his last line of defense. He just wanted to be really sure. So I wanted to get it so well tested it, that it just felt very comfortable. With the elevator rig nearly complete, Peter is finally ready to test it on a human guinea pig, himself. Not everybody gets to get paid to build their own roller coaster. Ready, and hey. three, two, one, action. I think we should sell it to Disneyland. It's, you know, it feels like about a six foot fall into a really softly strung trampoline. So it's, I'd put anybody in it. In fact, I think Joel's going to go on the, one of the next rides. Only after Peter has personally tested the safety and comfort of the rig is he willing to let director Joel Cohen take a ride. Peter Chesney's elevator rig, which would be equally at home in an amusement park as on a soundstage, is ready for filming. And Tim Robbins is about to become a falling star. When we return... The secrets of one of Alfred Hitchcock's most famous falls. From the earliest westerns and action pictures, filmmakers have turned to high falls in their quest to excite and thrill. The legendary master of suspense, Alfred Hitchcock, was no exception. For the climax to his 1942 thriller, Saboteur, actor Norman Lloyd is chased to the top of the Statue of Liberty. What follows is one of the most famous falls in cinema history. Come on, Fry. Hitchcock's problem was 
that this shot had to be made from a close-up and never cut away. And that's why people all these years have said, how did you do that shot? Leaving the audience guessing was precisely the director's intention. To help him achieve this convincing illusion, Hitchcock brought in visual effects specialist John P. Fulton. In those days, they didn't talk about special effects. They talked about trick cameramen. And he was known as the best. To film the scene, a full-size replica of the statue's hand and torch was erected on stage 12 at Universal Studios. Today, the Cinemagic attraction at Universal Studios Hollywood features a reproduction of the saboteur set and elevator rig used by Hitchcock. A portion of the statue's hand was attached to the bottom of a camera platform. On a cue, that platform with the camera, with Johnny Fulton, went up to the top of the stage. And simultaneously, I did various balletic movements, if you will, while the camera was going up to the top of the stage. And that gave the effect of my falling away from the camera, but indeed the opposite was true. It was the camera going away from me. To complete the effect, background footage from atop the actual Statue of Liberty was combined with a shot of Norman Lloyd filmed on stage 12. Hitchcock's method of pulling the camera away from the actor was used to create falling movie stars for decades. But the Hudsucker Proxies effects team has decided to attempt the exact opposite. They will harness the actor to an elevator rig that falls away from the camera. The reason we wanted to do that is that we were concerned that we have a realistic looking effect of gravity taking over and dragging him off into oblivion and hopefully it'll add a little realism to the beginning of the sequence. Peter Chesney uses a computer model that illustrates the exact duration and speed of each fall. This will allow him to make precise adjustments between takes. These are my last two rides, the red one there and the black one. He made slight changes so this one didn't go quite as fast. Peter controls the rate of the drop by adjusting the lengths of the rope and bungee cords. Duplicating the wind resistance of a skydiver in free fall will be a vital element in making the Hudsucker shots believable. The effects team videotapes a test of high-powered air movers to determine how many of the devices to use and at what distance. Air on! We had five air movers, and we would assign them to whatever part of the body was featured in the shot. With all systems on the elevator rig tested and ready to go, the filmmakers prepare for an actual take. Robbins is filmed against a blue screen. This is a blue background that will later be replaced by computer with a background shot representing the New York City skyline. Finally, the moment of truth has arrived. Three, two, one! Peter Chesney's ingenious design has given the Coen brothers just the shot they were looking for. When we come back, the creation of a spectacular falling sequence for Time Cop begins by staging the real thing. In the futuristic thriller Time Cop, action star Jean-Claude Van Damme and director Peter Hyams are collaborating with the visual effects and stunt teams for a time travel high fall. Unlike Tim Robbins' fall in Hudsucker Proxy, Van Damme's face will not be visible on the way down. This allows visual effects supervisor Gregory McMurray of VIFX to stage a real free fall. Dangling from one wire each uh, through a pant leg, we swung these two stuntmen out uh, off of a 23-story building. Uh, we basically let them fall free fall until they got up 15, 20 feet from the ground and then slowed them down very quickly. Once the 200-foot plunge is captured on film, the footage is turned over to the VIFX digital technicians. You notice the, when these guys are falling, because we have two separate wires on, the wires are bouncing considerably. That could be a little bit of a problem. Harry, show them the mat. 
so he can pull the guys right out of the picture. To remove the wires from the picture, the falling stuntmen are electronically separated from the surroundings and inserted over a clean background shot of the building. A separate image of falling debris is scanned into the computer and added over the scene to heighten the effect. And then take uh, this one right here, yeah. put that up next over there. With the finishing touch of a computer animated splash, the stuntmen vanish into the future in the middle of their fall. While the time cop plunge was filmed against a real building, creating the Hudsucker Proxies background requires some imaginative special effects. These will be provided by master model maker Mark Stetson. Mark and his creative crew at Stetson Visual Services previously built convincing miniatures for Total Recall, Bugsy, and Blade Runner. For the Hudsucker Proxy, Mark is constructing a stylized version of the 1958 New York City skyline on a 1 24th scale. The design of the miniature city is based on photographs of real Manhattan buildings selected by production designer Dennis Gassner. A team of 31 model makers cut, frame and assembled 20 skyscrapers to be used for wide exterior shots throughout the movie. For the falling sequence, the miniature Manhattan will replace the blue screen behind Tim Robbins. The greatest challenge of this project has been um, the uh, scope and scale of the, of the project as a whole. The cityscape will be quite large and fill up an entire stage easily. The buildings range in height from maybe 10 feet to as much as 40 feet. A lot of detail reproduction. There's more than 9,000 windows involved in this thing. Each of them has to be separately installed and glazed. The plan is to position the buildings horizontally during the actual shooting. And rather than stand these 40-foot buildings up and try to put a camera 40 feet in the air, we found it much easier to put the camera at one end of the stage and run the camera to the other end of the stage, simulating a vertical fall. Mark knows it's the details that make a miniature believable. He adds pedestrians, street signs, and model cars on the sideways mounted small scale street. Mike McAllister must make sure that the shots of the miniature set and the shots of the actor in the studio will work together perfectly when they're combined. And these little dolls help us visualize it because we can you know, sort of pretend like we're the camera and tilt our head around and various other things and visualize the shot before we try to program it. The effects crew also uses dolls to shoot a rough version of the falling sequence. The shots are edited together and shown to the director for approval. While filming of the miniatures continues, Peter Chesney's crew is perfecting the final part of the falling sequence. Tim Robbins is securely fastened into the harness. His costume, constructed to accommodate the harness and wires, is carefully adjusted. Now the whole point of this shot is, is that it's supposed to look like Tim has been in free fall and then all of a sudden comes to a screeching halt. To accomplish the effect, Robbins begins at a dead stop just over the camera. On cue, he is pulled back quickly to the top of the stage. The illusion works by applying a simple trick, running the film in reverse. When that happens, Robbins appears to magically stop just before he smashes into the lens. For the scene where he falls into the camera lens, it was one that, unlike the elevator rig, was much more of the spur of the moment type design work. We had our basic flying harness and rigging. You have two or three people up on a simple step ladder, stepping off into space, and anytime you can get away with something simple, everybody likes it. While the mechanics of the effect are relatively simple, the performance is complex because Tim must do everything backwards. Stop there. It's a more complicated reverse action to get right. Yeah, what it is, is going from surprise to terror as you go up, so that it looks like it's going from terror to yeah, nice clean surprise. Yeah, but it's, it's terror, 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 stop, terror, 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 surprise. Surprise, exactly. 
Once the movement is choreographed, the crew is ready to put theory into practice. Here we go, folks. Standing by, please. Between takes, Joel works closely with Tim to perfect the performance. It's a little bit of forward movement like you're pressing down on a piece of glass underneath you. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, just a little bit of that. Just a few, but yeah, exactly. With each take, the performance like gets closer to the Cohen brothers' vision. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. 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 After 15 takes while hanging on wires all day, Tim is happier than anyone when the Cohen brothers are finally satisfied. For the effects wizards, the months of preparation and effort are rewarded when they see their work on the big screen. When you combine the vision of filmmakers like Joel and Ethan Cohen with the ingenuity of effects artists like Peter Chesney and Mike McAllister, the result is truly groundbreaking movie magic.